hello, my name is Rebecca Fay and I'm Marketing Director at Natural Capital Partners. I'd like to welcome you all today to hear about the role and uptake of carbon pricing. We have three speakers today, Jonathan Shopley, Managing Director of Natural Capital Partners, John Ward, Managing Director of Vivid Economics, and Jeff Swart, Director of International Policy from the International Emissions Trading Association, otherwise known as AITA. The webinar is scheduled to last for one hour and we'll leave, you ten, we'll leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. You're all on mute, so please use the panel on the right-hand side of the screen to submit any questions and we'll go through them at the end. So I'm now very pleased to hand over to Jonathan to get us started. Rebecca, thank you very much, uh, and apologies for that little pause. Um, so I'm Jonathan Shopley, uh, Managing Director at uh, Natural Capital Partners, and it's really a great pleasure and a privilege to have two guest speakers in this afternoon's webinar. Uh, Rebecca, you've, you've uh, already mentioned uh, John, who's Managing Director of Vivid Economics. Uh, Vivid Economics does some amazing strategic economics consultancy work for governments, for businesses, and John, you've specialised in climate economics, climate finance, and um, you'll be speaking about uh, some of the work that you and ECOFIS have done for the World Bank in looking at uh, the rise of carbon pricing and its importance. So thank you very much, uh, very much for joining. And Jeff, uh, as Managing Director of International uh, uh, of, of um, uh, international climate business at AITA. Um, Jeff leads the work of that organization, which is uh, an association of 140 members uh, looking um, to the future of international emissions trading as a critical uh, solution to climate change. Um, Jeff, really particularly pleased to have you join from Beijing, where it is midnight. Um, and I know too that you're very much at home there as a fluent speaker of Mandarin. Uh, so if the jet lag and the time of day makes you uh, unintelligible, we'll know that you've just switched over to Mandarin by mistake. But thank you very much for, 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 joining, uh, for joining us. So um, the agenda for the webinar, um, and I'm just going to remind you all uh, that um, don't wait till the end. Q&A. Uh, if you've got any questions you want to ask uh, any of the speakers, um, please just tap that into the question panel on the right-hand side of your screen. But I'm going to kick off uh, and say a few words about carbon pricing essentials, because I think carbon pricing means very different things to different people. Um, I'm then going to hand over to John to talk about the role and the uptake of carbon pricing, uh, specifically as you've uh, scope that out um, uh, in, in the work that you've done recently uh, for the World Bank. And then Jeff, it's your turn uh, from Beijing to talk about carbon pricing in a post-Paris world. And then I'm just going to um, uh, close out uh, the formal part before we get to the Q&A by putting carbon pricing uh, in the context of what businesses do. Uh, next slide, please. So you... I suspect uh, that there are many people uh, uh, tuned in who understand exactly what carbon pricing is all about, but I'm going to go back to basics here because it's often quite a, a misunderstood term. Uh, so I'm going to start off and say, um, with, with, with the, given that I'm in the, in the company of economists, um, pricing greenhouse gas emissions really accelerates the transition to new carbon, low carbon economy because it internalizes an environmental externality. There is a view that we can emit greenhouse gas emissions at the moment largely for free. And if there was a price on those emissions, we would uh, factor that in. And so what all the policies allow us to try and find a price of carbon uh, that gets us on a, uh, a reduction trajectory. So a carbon price, generally when people talk about uh, prices, um, it's, it, it tends to 
to speak to what a, an entity pays uh, to emit a greenhouse gas, a, a ton of greenhouse gas emissions. So there are different ways of doing that. Um, uh, there are carbon taxes, which you can uh, impose on emitters so that they uh, pay a fixed amount with a view that as that price works its way through the system, that people get that pricing signal and therefore uh, reduce their emissions as a, as a response. So what you get with carbon taxes, uh, particularly is a, is a fixed price with an unknown impact on, on, on emissions reductions. And those taxes generally get collected by um, governments uh, and those revenues may or may not fund low carbon investments. Carbon trading uh, is the other uh, main mechanism of uh, pricing, uh, putting a price on, on carbon emissions, particularly cap and trade systems. Now that's very different to tax in, in that it focuses on setting a cap, a reduction target, and the price is set by the market. So the price could be, uh, is very difficult to predict, but the outcome, the environmental outcome, the climate outcome, uh, will be determined by the cap. Now, in that instance, the sale of allowances generally by governments raises revenues for the governing entity, and trading allowances rewards low carbon investments by participants. They can sell allowances that they don't need if they're more efficient. Carbon offsetting generally fits into the carbon trading uh, category, um, and carbon offsets uh, finance projects that reduce emissions outside, generally outside of that. And those of you on, on, on the call with whom uh, that, uh, work with us, natural capital partners, know that carbon offsetting is a critical part of our uh, carbon offset inclusive, uh, uh, offset inclusive carbon management services. Now, a shadow price is often used and sometimes confused with um, other forms of carbon pricing. And a shadow price is what, what entities use uh, when they're making um, forward plans. Um, so it's not money that gets paid by one entity to another. It is a cost that's put onto emissions that allow governments to then price in the impacts of their policies to anticipate what that might do. Uh, John, I'm in your territory here, so I'll leave you to pick that up. And then companies also use shadow pricing when they're planning their capital investments. Um, I just want to say um, uh, that um, one of the, just going back to carbon offsetting for, for, for a moment, uh, the, the Kyoto Protocol, which is now being superseded, will be by the Paris Agreement, had a flexible market mechanism built into that. Uh, the clean development mechanism was the, the offset component of that. Very successful, actually, uh, in um, over, over its life uh, time, uh, until this, uh, from its inception till this year. Uh, this is a mechanism that reduced about 1.7 billion tons of, of, uh, of carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions across 8,000 projects right around the world, 11, uh, one, 111 11 countries. And what it also did was mobilize uh, about 400 billion uh, US dollars of investment uh, driving low carbon um, technologies into developing uh, economies to accelerate both growth and other with significant co benefits around poverty alleviation. So I hope that helps set the scene and now I'm going to pass over to you John to uh, uh, pick up from there. Thank you. Thank you very much Jonathan and um, thank you very much indeed for the warm introduction and thank you very much to everyone listening for taking an hour out of their busy schedules. Um, what I'd like to do today is just very quickly talk through some of the key findings from a recent piece of work that uh, we have been working on with the World Bank and EcoFits as Jonathan mentioned um, called the State and Trends of Carbon Pricing. Uh, this is an annual publication by the World Bank and I think they refer to it as their flagship publication on carbon pricing and what it then tries to do is um, a couple of things first of all it tries to provide an overview of some of the key empirical facts around what is happening in carbon pricing around the world which way are carbon prices going which jurisdictions are introducing carbon prices how high are those carbon prices and provide a, a kind of a reference good book for people who want to understand the current uh, view on carbon pricing, the current state of carbon pricing. 
However, in addition, what the report has been doing the last couple of years is going one step further than just providing that empirical information, but also providing a little bit of information on some of the key policy issues that need to be addressed or thought about when contemplating increasing carbon prices or using carbon prices as, as, as part of a toolkit by governments and helping both governments and those who have to respond to those policies understand a little bit more about what the motivation for those policy issues might be and how they might respond to some of those challenges. So it has this, both this empirical aspect and this an analytical aspect. And if we just flip to the next slide, um, we'll see that the, the first section is really a, this empirical overview of, of where we are in carbon pricing around the world. And then the last two sections focus, uh, I, I'll focus on these two policy issues, one on evolving to an international carbon market, and secondly, some of the issues around managing policy interactions when you have a carbon price. So let's flip on to the next slide and, and look at um, uh, the current status of carbon pricing. And when I see this figure, um, it, every year I, I'm slightly surprised by, um, by this figure and, and, and just, and to my mind at least, how impressive it is um, in demonstrating that carbon pricing is um, making a difference and is actually becoming an important policy um, among the, within the toolkit of a lot of countries around the world. And what this shows is the percentage of global emissions that are covered by an explicit carbon price uh, around the world. So that could be either a carbon tax or an emissions trading system. And what we can see is that there's been a steady rise in the proportion of emissions covered by carbon pricing around the world, um, gro growing significantly in 2005 when the EU ETS first came into place, then steady growth over the last few years. Um, and what's really significant, I think, from this graph is that if the Chinese emissions trading system comes into play as is expected in 2017, um, then we're going to be looking at something appro approaching 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions being subject to a carbon price. And, and given the, the kind of controversy which is often associated with carbon pricing, um, I think to, to just to understand and appreciate the, 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 the increasing scale and prevalence of carbon pricing is, is, is really quite significant. So that's where we are in terms of the coverage of carbon pricing, but if we flip to the next slide, we can see some of the individual uh, details uh, around schemes which have come into play or are likely to come into play in the next few years. I won't go through these in detail, but what you can see is that there are, uh, there's positive momentum across many different jurisdictions and regions of the world, from the recent developments in Korea um, uh, and, and China, which is looking to, as I meant, said, mentioned to, uh, looking to introduce, introduce a carbon carbon price next year, uh, through various initiatives in Europe with Portugal and France introducing a carbon price floor, onto North America with Ontario and Alberta also uh, taking uh, increasing action, um, and into um, uh, Latin America with Mexico recently announcing that it intends to launch a national carbon market by 2018. So we see the spread of carbon pricing across all regions of the world. That said, I think it's important to recognise that it's not a, a constant, it's not a, a constant linear pattern of, of growth in the role of carbon pricing, and we have seen an, a few setbacks in, 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 in the course of the last year, with both um, Kazakhstan temporarily suspending its emissions trading system and South Africa announcing that it planned to, uh, whilst it still planned to go ahead with the carbon tax, um, the launch of that carbon tax was going to be delayed. But I think, nonetheless, the, the overall picture is one of, of steady growth in carbon pricing. But what the next slide shows is that although we have a steady growth in the coverage of carbon pricing, arguably we have a situation where the, the level of those carbon prices remains too low um, to drive the long-term change in decarbonisation that we expect to see. Uh, and what this figure shows is that around about 75% of the emissions that are subject to a carbon price actually face a carbon price of less than or around $10 a tonne. Um, and I think that whilst um, there are good reasons for carbon, for, for, for carbon prices to stay low and for, it is a reflection of the cost effectiveness of carbon pricing as a tool, that it can drive some emission reductions even with prices as low as $10 a tonne, 
Um, I think most assessments would, would suggest that if we are serious about reaching the, the, the goals in the Paris Agreement of, of two degrees, then we're likely to have to see a significant increase in carbon prices in the coming years, um, as well as continuing to see this prevalence uh, in, in, in increase in scope of carbon pricing. We'll need to see the, the level of carbon pricing also increase. So if we flip to the next slide, um, what I'd like to do now is move on from talking about some of the, the, the kind of a broad overview of where carbon pricing is to a couple of the, the policy issues which are also tackled in the report. The first of those relates to the possible evolution of an international carbon market. And I think the, the starting point from this is to say that if increasing number of countries are serious about using carbon pricing as a policy instrument to reduce their emissions, then the scope for an international carbon market um, has actually significantly increased in recent years because we suddenly see more and more countries using carbon pricing domestically. There is now a greater scope for this to become an international policy instrument. And when I talk about an international carbon market, what I mean is that a country which has signed up to making a particular emission reduction doesn't necessarily have to make that emission reduction within the country um, the territorial uh, uh, aspect of that country, um, but rather can, um, can finance that emission reduction in another part of the world. Um, it still retains responsibility for delivering that emission reduction, but it sources that emission reduction from somewhere else in the world. And this is something which uh, a lot of countries have identified they're keen to be able to, to, to do. Um, and it's something also that was explicitly encouraged, uh, and perhaps to many people in a surprising uh, degree of detail in the, in the Paris Agreement, where there was an explicit mention of the possibility that international carbon markets could be used as a means of delivering the emission reductions and hence the, the, the objectives of the Paris Agreement. If we pop to the next slide, we see why this is such an attractive option. Um, if countries no longer have to source their emission reductions just for within the country, uh, the geographic bounds of their country, but instead can source their emission reductions anywhere in the world, then they have the option to source those emission reductions where they're cheapest, um, not where they not uh, not just within the in the in the boundaries of that country. And what our analysis uh, in the State and Trends of Carbon Pricing report does is it tries to provide a, an understanding of how significant those emission reduction, uh, that, that those cost reductions could be. And what our analysis suggests is that even out to 2030, um, the evolution and the development of an international carbon market could cut the cost of delivering emission reductions by more than 30%. And if we go out to 2050, when emission reductions are have to going to be really steep if we're, we're serious about tackling climate change and therefore potentially they're going to become more difficult to deliver, then the cost savings that you can generate from, an, uh, from allowing this flexibility in where you source your emission reductions is going to become even more significant. And we could see cost reductions of, of, of more than 50%. And we're really looking at a situation where when you're getting to that sort of level of cost saving, it, become, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to justify how policymakers could not make use of those sorts of cost savings. Um, and, and it's difficult, for, at least from my perspective, to see how you could maintain the political legitimacy of carbon pricing unless you were going to be able to exploit those cost savings. And of course, those cost savings are very real and very, very material, and they can be used both by uh, corporates who then no longer have to face such a, a binding, co uh, binding carbon constraint and don't have to face such high costs to deliver emission reductions, or they can be passed through to governments to invest in, in infrastructure, in education, in health, or indeed those cost savings can be used to accelerate further climate action. Um, and all of that becomes possible in a world in which international carbon markets are developed and become a, tool, a, a key way in which emission reductions are delivered around the world. That said, if we flip to the next slide, what we can see, oh sorry, this is just a very quick slide which gives a, um, an overview of where you might see uh, which countries are kind of going to be purchasing emission reductions. Um, and those are the countries which are going to, and which countries are going to be um, selling emission reductions. And what you can see is that the countries uh, with the green labels are the countries which are likely to be selling emission reductions. 
and the countries which are likely to be buying emission reductions according to our analysis are the countries uh, in red. So we see that most of the emission purchases are done by the US, Mexico, China and Europe and most of the selling of emissions comes from uh, uh, less developed countries in Latin America, Africa and parts of India and Southeast Asia. That said, if we pop to the, pop to the next slide, um, I think it's important to realize that um, despite the significant prize which is available from carbon pricing and international carbon markets, um, there are a number of barriers which potentially stand in the way. Um, I won't go into all of those barriers now, but the report goes into quite a lot of detail identifying what some of those key barriers might be and as well what some of the solutions to those might be. Um, and just to pick a couple out of uh, uh, which I think are particularly important, um, one is around loss of control. If a country no longer is able to determine which emission reductions are going to come from within its jurisdiction and therefore what the price of carbon is going to be within its jurisdiction, they may be significantly less, they may be uh, quite worried about what the implications of that can be because they suddenly have a volatile carbon price which is potentially outside of the, the, the remit of that individual country to influence uh, significantly. Um, there may also be significant um, problems um, if policymakers are looking to deliver emission reductions, for instance, in order to, uh, as part of a general package. Um, uh, that will also bring other policy benefits. So, for instance, in China, it's a very good example, part of the justification around um, carbon pricing is that it will also have an impact on local air pollution. But if you, you have a situation where actually China is realizing emission reductions by purchasing um, emission reductions from Africa rather than delivering them within China, um, then those potential, those reductions in air, those improvements in air quality might not be realized. It, so there are challenges to the evolution of an international carbon market, but I think there are also important solutions. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over all of those solutions, but um, they are there, and I think there is increasing uh, interest in exploring those solutions, um, both uh, at, an inter at, a, at a kind of a national level among governments and also through at a kind of a, a corporate level and a trade association level through the work of people like Aita and perhaps Jeff will pick up on that in a few minutes. Um, the, the other key aspect of the report in terms of policy issues um, moves back to thinking about carbon pricing within a domestic context and uh, addresses or asks the question about how policymakers should think about carbon pricing as one part of a broader policy toolkit that can help deliver emission reductions and helps think through some of the challenges which are, arise when you're using carbon pricing, not in, not in isolation, but as part of a broader suite of instruments. And if we flip to the next slide, um, what we do in the report is just to highlight three main categories that need to be thought about when combining carbon pricing with other policy instruments. So these other policy instruments might fall into one of three categories. First of all, they might be complementary. They might support the delivery of emission reductions. Um, and you can think about the examples of that might be power sector reform where when you have a liberalized and effective uh, power market, the carbon price will flow through that carbon market, uh, through that power market much more quickly and much more effectively. And people in that carbon market, uh, both companies and consumers of, of electricity, will be able to respond to that signal much more effectively. Um, and therefore, the carbon price will be much more powerful as a way of delivering emission reductions. There are then also some policies which aim to have the same overall objective of carbon pricing in reducing emissions, but because of the way they work, they somehow in some ways overlap with carbon pricing and potentially reduce the effectiveness of carbon pricing. And one of the, one of the very um, pertinent examples of that relates to renewable power, uh, renewable portfolio standards and feed-in tariffs to support renewable energy generation. Clearly, they're designed with the same uh, goal and the same aim as a carbon price. They're trying to support the delivery of emission reductions. But because they force particular forms of emission reductions, they, they're, they're a policy which encourages particular form of emission reductions in the form of additional renewable power generation, they might actually not allow carbon pricing to be quite as effective 
because the, the beauty of carbon pricing is that it allows the market to determine where those emission reductions are going to come from, where these policies are, are selecting and identifying particular sources of emission reductions. And in that situation, you may get kind of unfortunate uh, uh, negative feedback mechanisms whereby you undermine the effectiveness of the carbon price unless you're very careful. And then the third category of, policy uh, of, of policies which need to be thought about are, are countervailing policies, policies which frankly just don't work in the same direction as carbon pricing and are actually um, pulling in, the, in completely the opposite direction. And, and the clearest example there is, is, is of course fossil fuel subsidies which um, despite various commitments uh, from G20 countries remain uh, prevalent uh, around the world. So those are the three main categories of policy interaction which I think are important um, when thinking about uh, how carbon pricing fits into the broader policy suite. And if what we do, if we go, just flip to the last slide, um, what the report goes on to talk about is what are some of the things that policymakers could and should be doing in order to manage those interactions. And what are some of the things that stakeholders wishing to influence policymakers might also wish to encourage those policy makers to do. Um, I won't go through all of these. Um, again, it, there's a lot there and it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of material we could potentially talk to and um, I'd be delighted to take questions on any of it. I just think a, a couple of things that I, I think really came out to me very strongly when working on this report is really the importance of policy evolution and the need for policy makers to recognize that policies won't necessarily be perfect first time round and that they will be uh, interactions which develop which they haven't anticipated or that they haven't thought through fully and that those are, you know, the, the, even with the best win in the world, you'll never be able to predict all of those problems up front. And therefore the importance which comes from building in a structured process of review which allows policymakers and people who wish to engage in policy making and influence policy making a predictable and understandable framework as to when these policy interactions are going to be looked at, how they're going to be looked at, and in what way tensions and uh, challenges might be resolved. And I think we are increasingly seeing um, this uh, policy makers recognize the importance of building in flexibility, structured flexibility into their, uh, their, their policy design so that people understand that um, there will be an opportunity to reflect on what has worked well, what has not worked well, and on that reflection build improved processes over time. Um, and I think you know, the, the importance of realizing that you can't get everything right first time doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to introduce a carbon price and doesn't mean that you shouldn't um, doesn't mean you should you should be a reason for inaction but it does mean that policymakers need to develop sensible and coherent processes which allow people to understand what can be learned from initial periods of carbon pricing and from that evolve oh steadily over time and iterate over time to develop a, a more sophisticated and more coherent policy package so with that, uh, I'll conclude uh, and hand over to Jeff. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, John, for, for an excellent presentation. And my name is Jeff Swartz. I'm the Managing Director at AITA. I'll be talking to you a little bit about uh, the role and uptake of carbon pricing in, in a post-Paris world. Um, some of the slides I'll go through um, are complementary to what John was already showing, so my uh, speed through a couple of them, but, but I hope that um, what I'll be discussing complements well some of the, the key main messages that, that John just passed on. Next slide, please. So for those of you who aren't familiar with AITA, we are an international uh, business association uh, made up of um, more than 130 different companies in a multi-sector fashion. So we don't represent any one particular industry type or, or company type, and we're collectively uh, a voice of, of business on, on carbon markets around the world. Uh, we were founded in 1999 out of the Kyoto Protocol, um, and since then, you know, we've been riding the wave of, of carbon markets as they've uh, been uh, implemented over the years, and uh, now we have offices around the world, and we're very pleased to have uh, both natural capital partners and, and Vivid Economics as, as AIDA members. Next slide, please. So 
this year, 2016, um, was obviously a very interesting year for a number of different reasons, but for climate change, it was uh, absolutely remarkable. There was so much momentum on uh, climate change policy throughout the year. Um, the biggest one, the one that grabbed the most headlines, obviously just happened uh, last month, and that was when the, the Paris Agreement entered into force on November 4th. A, a full uh, two or three years earlier than uh, many people expected uh, after uh, governments left Paris uh, last December. Many people expected that the agreement, um, if it were to enter uh, into force early, would be entering in 2018, 2019 at the earliest. Um, so it was really a, a terrific marriage between the U.S. and China who uh, diplomatically pulled out all of the stops uh, to uh, get enough countries to uh, ratify the Paris Agreement early on this year. Um, we also saw a, a deal on aviation emissions growth um, at ICAO, the International Civil Aeronautical Organization, and that puts uh, limits on um, the amount of emissions that can be produced in the global aviation emissions sector. That deal has been 20 years in the making. Um, and it, it was agreed to in Montreal in October. And then there was another um, major breakthrough on um, HFC emissions, so uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which are regulated under the Montreal Protocol, um, but they were not completely 100% covered. Um, and there was a Kegley Summit, which provided an amendment to that Montreal Protocol to move towards uh, complete coverage of HFC emissions. So there was so much uh, momentum going into uh, the climate change negotiations in Marrakesh, which which wrapped up last month, and I think um, despite um, you know some of the political changes that have occurred uh, throughout this year, the momentum on climate policy and the institutionalization of international climate change leadership um, is is going full steam ahead. Um, at the same time, you know climate action has become much more than just an OECD. Uh, member country club issue. Um, every country now is putting forward a, a nationally determined contribution under the Paris framework. Every country is setting in place uh, some form of roadmap to decarbonize uh, its economy. And now we're entering into a phase of, of implementing on those um, nationally determined contributions and looking at ways in which countries can, can cooperate with each other and that's where carbon pricing enters into the fore and, and what John was, was talking about when he, he showed the significant cost savings that could be accrued uh, in, in partnering on carbon markets. So the next slide shows you uh, basically where um, we have seen now all of the different countries that have um, signed on to the Paris Agreement. Um, many people, I think, who don't follow this issue closely haven't really realized that the Paris Agreement is in force now. It will not, uh, no longer not be in force. It's done. Um, it has, as of late last month, you know, over 112 countries which have ratified uh, the agreement. I think altogether they represent something like 78% of, of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. There are still some countries which have not ratified, um, but there is an earnest effort uh, to uh, get all countries to ratify in the coming years. Um, but even for those that haven't ratified, you know, we've already crossed the threshold for the agreement in, to enter into force. And this has been uh, such a significant achievement this year. Right. So I'm going to show you on the next slide a little bit about um, where the Paris Agreement and carbon markets sort of come together. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to some great work that uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers has done recently on um, the low carbon economy index. And, you know, I don't work for Price Waterhouse Coopers or in anything like this, but I think one of the wonderful things that they showed was the decarbonization rate. So um, we have in the Paris Agreement a two degree goal. But at the same time, that's a very high-level, uh, long-term objective. But we need to know how that translates into a yearly uh, goal in reducing emissions. And uh, they've calculated that we need to have a decarbonization rate of 6.5% every year in order to stay uh, on the two-degree pathway. 
Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, last year, our decarbonization rate was 2.8%. And if you look at all of the nationally determined contributions of the G20, we're only at about 3%. So we need to do more and we have to go further. And I think that's where um, policy instruments like carbon pricing could be very helpful. Next slide, please. Um, and all of that is to say that uh, business is increasingly in the spotlight. Um, the Paris Agreement sets a target. Business knows where it needs to go. Um, there are investors and stakeholders that uh, are putting in place um, uh, very serious climate strategies and actions. And there are a number of companies which are going above and beyond uh, what they've ever done before in terms of putting in place internal carbon pricing or shadow carbon pricing as Jonathan was describing and therefore it's it's really a fork in the road for business and um, it's it's a decision that many businesses are are facing uh, in, this year and in the coming years and I think again that's where uh, the relevance of carbon pricing comes into play because that is is a, an important um, policy instrument to help businesses reduce their emissions. Next slide please. So the um, Paris Agreement really provides uh, a menu of um, different um, options for governments to uh, put in place uh, policies and efforts to reduce emissions. Um, it is not a long agreement, you know, it's about 15 pages, um, and, it, and it addresses, you know, international climate governance, it addresses how to scale up climate finance, it addresses how to uh, deal with adaptation and make sure that the most vulnerable countries in the world are protected, but it also has in it uh, a specific chapter on market mechanisms and a, a specific um, uh, rule around how countries uh, can work together on implementing market mechanisms to meet the goals of their nationally determined contributions and in fact to increase those nationally determined contributions over time. Next slide, please. Um, the specific elements in uh, the, the Paris Agreement um, when it comes to carbon markets, which, which John was referring to, um, is this notion of um, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. And that's uh, included in the, the sixth uh, article or chapter of the Paris Agreement. And really what this says is that countries can now cooperate with each other uh, to uh, reduce emissions through market-driven policy instruments. So a country like Canada can transfer emission reductions uh, to Sweden, for example, and Sweden can transfer back emissions reductions to Canada. And each of those countries can use those transfers of emissions reductions to meet their respective nationally determined contribution. This is a flexible way for countries to meet their targets. And it goes beyond, uh, you know, how carbon markets functioned under the Kyoto Protocol. It's much, much more open-ended. Um, and so it could really open uh, uh, many different doors for, for carbon markets to uh, be utilized by a number of different countries. And it doesn't require certain countries to, to use it. It can be used by any country uh, in the world. And there's also an, another part of Article 6, which is a new emissions mitigation mechanism. And this is a new credit mechanism where countries can receive emission reduction uh, units and, um, and, and they can export those in return for climate finance. So something like we had under the Kyoto Protocol. So all of this work now is um, going into the implementation phase under the UNFCCC and they're going to work towards uh, the goal of having it all finished by 2018. So Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, in a nutshell, is a home for, for carbon pricing and carbon markets to um, be developed over the coming years. And, and it's very exciting for, for people who've been working on this issue for, for many years. Next slide, please. So I'm going to um, discuss very uh, briefly um, um, where countries are um, implementing carbon pricing, but I, I forgot I had this slide, and this slide shows you those 90-odd um, countries that John was mentioning that signal interest in using international carbon markets to meet their nationally determined contributions. Now, China, the United States, and, and Europe have uh, carbon markets in some form or another, 
but in, in this slide, um, they, it, they, they are shaded as if they don't want to use international markets. And the nuance there is that uh, they're going to use their domestic carbon market to meet their target. Um, so there are a number of countries which plan to participate in an international market, and, and this map um, describes it more in full. Right, so I think now I'll, I'll move on in the interest of time um, to the next slides uh, around where carbon pricing is being implemented uh, on the ground around the world. Next slide, please. So there are currently around 12% of uh, global greenhouse gases covered under uh, uh, an uh, emissions trading system or uh, a carbon price, a carbon tax, and collectively um, around 40% of global GDP is covered under a carbon market. Um, it's really a story around China, Europe, and North America in, in large part in terms of where the action is. Um, North America, I'll, I'll get into in a moment, is um, mostly implementing carbon markets subnationally. In Europe, we've had emissions trading for over 10 years. And now China is, is moving towards a national emissions trading system, which will start next year. There are other countries which have an emissions trading system like uh, Korea and New Zealand. And there are a number of other countries which are working uh, with the World Bank and, and other institutions to move towards implementing a, a carbon market or carbon price over time. But this is the story today uh, in terms of where the action is. Next slide, please. So in, um, in Europe, I mentioned we've had emissions trading for, for over 10 years. Uh, it is a, a system where over 11,000 installations are included. Um, we have seen recently um, a, a drop in, in, in uh, the price of carbon as a result of the economic downturn. But just this morning, in fact, in, in Strasbourg, um, parliamentarians in, in, in the European Parliament uh, approved plans to move forward with reforms of the European carbon market. I won't go into detail on those, but they're moving very quickly now to reform the emissions trading system in Europe so that it can uh, deliver on the 40% uh, reduction target that Europe has set out for itself in its nationally determined contribution. Um, right, so let's move on then to uh, what's happening in uh, China and in North America. Next slide. In China, they have had a uh, subnational emissions trading system across seven uh, pilot uh, regions, uh, both cities and provinces, since 2013. And starting next year, the government in China will launch a, a national emissions trading system. Um, this is despite you know, the fact that China is, is uh, going into a period of, of um, uh, economic slowdown. The government, uh, central government in Beijing, wants to move full speed ahead to introduce uh, a mechanism that can fully decarbonize China's economy. Next slide, please. The emissions trading system in China will cover uh, over eight different major uh, emitting sectors of the economy. Um, you see before you all of those different uh, sectors. And really, this, this is going to affect the world, because indirectly now, uh, many uh, businesses uh, which buy products from China will be paying a price on carbon, um, because their Chinese uh, counterparts will, in turn, be paying that price uh, as, as a result of the implementation of the national emissions trading system. Next slide, please. Um, the emissions trading system in China will begin uh, around the third quarter of next year, and it'll move on in phases. Um, and after 2020, the government is seriously looking at how it might link uh, this emissions trading system with, with another country. Uh, that is work uh, that they have already begun. Um, despite all of the, the preparatory work uh, here in China to uh, get the emissions trading system up and running, many companies in China aren't yet ready for it. They, they aren't familiar with the concept of emissions trading, uh, and that's something my association is, is working very hard on to help Chinese companies prepare for the emissions trading system. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on from China, and I'll, I'll just uh, talk to you very quickly about North America and specifically Canada uh, in the next slide. Uh, this is a very busy slide. I apologize. But the, the message here is that you know Canada is moving towards uh, a, a, ca a carbon price across all of its provinces. Um, the federal government just last week uh, came together uh, with all of the, the premiers in Canada and they uh, agreed 
uh, to move towards uh, carbon pricing across the economy. Uh, there's uh, one province, Saskatchewan, which is not yet ready, uh, but in Canada, governments are using a, a mix between taxes and, and trading systems and also uh, uh, performance benchmarks, uh, which, which result in uh, a, a baseline credit system, which you see in Alberta. So Canada is a real bright spot for, for carbon pricing and a lot of activities taking place there uh, this year and, and in the years to come. I'll move ahead to my, uh, my conclusions, uh, if that's okay, Rebecca, um, so that we have enough, uh, enough time for questions. And I think here the, the, the conclusion is that you know, carbon pricing is, is definitely becoming a, a policy that many different countries are, are looking at uh, employing. There are a number of initiatives outside of the United Nations uh, framework um, that are helping countries do this. Um, and again, I mean, this is repetitive from what John mentioned already, but this all matters because uh, the cost of implementing those nationally determined contributions uh, will be much, much lower with more countries putting in place a price on carbon and cooperating. And that in turn will lead to more ambition, uh, which can help us get towards that, that two degree goal. Um, so I think I'll stop there uh, in terms of uh, my contributions and, and I look forward uh, to, to, to questions from, from everyone on, on the webinar. Thank you again. Jeff uh, and John, um, thank you very much. It's Jonathan, uh, just for a final uh, slide uh, for me or final comments from me. Um, I wanted to put this all terrific amount of information, main messages for me are uh, international trading, whether that's cap and trade and offsetting, reduces prices, uh, you know, reduces the cost of reduction significantly. And John, you mentioned about 30% or more by 2050. And Jeff uh, and John together, you've talked about how systems are growing sort of bottom up under the Paris Agreement to cover large sectors, large parts of the world. So what does that mean for business? And most of you on the webinar this afternoon will have been using uh, some of the market-based uh, mechanisms already to show climate leadership ahead of or beyond compliance. And so um, when it comes to carbon pricing, and I'd sort of define two points of that sort of shadow pricing and then uh, pricing under cap and trade and, and offsetting schemes, there, there are really useful elements, uh, useful ways in which these have, can both be deployed. Uh, in companies that are thinking about decarbonizing uh, their operations, um, one of the most useful ways of trying to anticipate and make sure that you don't lock in high carbon processes and equipment is to use a shadow price uh, in the calculations to figure out where your capital investments are going to be. There's always a question about, and I'll come back to this, what that shadow price should be and over what period of time you should apply that. Um, there are, and, and by the way, I just want to mention two, uh, two sort of initiatives, the, the Carbon Pricing Leadership Initiative, which the World Bank has played quite a role in, and, uh, and the CDP has also done some great reports on who's using what kind of, um, what, what kind of um, uh, pricing internally uh, to guide their, their strategies. Um, the carbon fee uh, is another internal mechanism, it's almost like an internal tax uh, where you uh, organizations might raise uh, internal funds uh, to a central fund by charging a, an amount for greenhouse gas emissions and then investing those funds into driving efficiencies, internal reductions, uh, and also changing behavior within their organizations. And, and Microsoft, Microsoft's carbon fee is a great example of that. Um, the, uh, the external piece, uh, given that we, we, we've spoken so much about markets emerging around the world and the mechanisms that are likely to evolve from the Paris Agreement as well, and the fact that uh, many of you have been using um, instruments, uh, greenhouse gas reduction instruments from the voluntary market, means that you have a great opportunity to uh, use external uh, mechanisms, as we've talked about. In other words, for organizations to fund reductions or fund sourcing and the capacity building in renewable energy, two things that really um, help decarbonize an organization. Now, we've already mentioned that uh, in using offsets, that gives an organization that might be at the very edge 
of its energy efficiency capacity at, uh, without spending amounts of decarbonizing that would put them at a competitive disadvantage on the market, uh, to find mechanisms or projects, offset projects around the world that lower the cost of reductions. Um, there are many organizations working in the voluntary space that Jeff mentioned uh, that are using carbon mitigation projects uh, to build resilience in their supply chain. So an example of that might be the tea packing company, uh, Betty's and Taylor's, that has a carbon mitigation afforestation project in their tea supply chain in Kenya, which delivers mitigation and also um, terrific co-benefits around biodiversity protection and, and reforestation. And that applies equally to other areas where different kinds of projects, like clean, clean cookstoves, uh, deliver on, sustain on a number of sustainable development goals, whether that be poverty alleviation, uh, gender support, and biodiversity protection. But together, these uh, market-based instruments that allow companies to set stretching targets reflecting the urgency of our need to decarbonize our economy, uh, it allows them to raise their ambition. And that might be framed in a get to zero target or uh, as has been promoted by uh, WRI, WWF, uh, CEP and the UN Global Compact, science-based targets, uh, an interpretation of what the science requires them to do as a business rather than as an economy to decarbonize uh, their operations. And those are very stretching goals. And the deployment of um, carbon pricing instruments like carbon offsets uh, really is critical to helping people raise their ambitions. And then finally, um, one, one, uh, one last point is, um, when companies raise their, uh, their ambition, there's always the question of how much do we do internally before we offset? And one of uh, where we go for external reductions using market-based mechanisms. And I think that um, uh, competitively focused organizations are always looking for the maximum impact for the lowest cost. And so if it's possible to reduce internally at a price lower than a reduction of goods sourced through the markets that we've talked about, that would be the obvious thing to do. And as John has mentioned, that can be done, that can generate real cost savings. If, however, um, uh, if, however, you've got very high costs uh, to reduce the next internal reduction, then using market-based instruments really is the sensible way to go. So actually, some of the carbon market uh, or the pricing mechanisms are a very useful indicator to companies when to go internal and when to go external to overall get themselves on target. Um, I think uh, that at that point, uh, I am going to hand over to you, uh, Rebecca, uh, to see to get some questions going. Thanks very much and thank you to John, Jeff and Jonathan for those presentations. Um, we've got a lot of questions so apologies in advance that we won't be able to get through them all in the eight minutes we have left for us um, but I will pick out some and hopefully we'll get those covered. One question which I think probably um, to go to Jeff first of all is um, could you give a bit of an update on what's going on with in India as regards to carbon pricing? Sure, and, and thanks for the question. I'll be brief. You know, the Indian government has prioritized uh, renewable energy development and um, new policies to uh, reduce carbon in uh, its agricultural sector. They have not yet uh, moved towards implementing anything related to carbon pricing. Uh, since 2013, the Indian government has had um, an energy efficiency saving scheme which uses a uh, market-based um, approach, but it, it's not explicit for carbon pricing. So I think uh, once China's national emissions trading system is up and running, uh, I, I expect India will be watching very closely how uh, China fares with that system and, and how they could uh, possibly explore doing something similarly in India. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, another question, there have been a few questions about the state of uh, the US in, in the light of the 
view of the president-elect and his recent appointment of Rick Perry. Um, so perhaps starting with you, Jonathan, and then going round, can you a view on what you think the likely participation of the US is going forward on, pro on carbon pricing type programs? Thank you. Uh, interesting question. And uh, I think the others will also be able to, to comment on this. My, my sense, uh, having been in Marrakesh when the election results came through, is that there is an incredible amount of work going on at the state level rather than the federal level in the United States, which will not be stopped by um, any prevarication or sort of pullback, in, in, in my view. So I think, you know, if you look at California, you look at the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, on, on the eastern seaboard, uh, there are states that are forging ahead and have redoubled their commitments to uh, carbon pricing through the sort of mechanisms that they have underway. But maybe I'll hand to, uh, to John just to, to make a comment on that too, and then over to Jeff. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Really, just to reiterate, I think what you're saying is that clearly at a federal level, um, it seems much less likely that there will be significant carbon pricing developments over the next few years at the federal level. Um, but at a state level, um, I think there was a, a, as you said, in Marrakesh and subsequent to Marrakesh, there has been a, a real uh, expression of commitment that um, there will continue to be action at the state level. Um, we've been. Uh, I, I know that um, there's, you know, there's a lot of interest. If we if we link this back to the question around carbon market linking, there's a, a lot of interest in uh, thinking about how California might move forge ahead in co cooperation with Mexico. Um, and so, and, and as you say, Reggie still is in place and, and, and doing a, an, an important job. So, yes, at a federal level, challenging, but continued action at the state level. I think. Thank you, um, and I'll. Hand over to, to, to Jeff, if you, uh, to Jonathan, sorry, if there's anything further. Yeah. No, I, I think next up is Jeff because he'll have a fantastic view from Beijing, I'm sure. Jeff, over to you. Yeah, I mean, there's nobody should um, window dress the fact that, you know, the federal American government is, is not going to be as uh, active on um, carbon pricing as um, the current Obama administration. Uh, that being said, however, um, the folks at EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute uh, in, in America, did an amazing analysis which basically showed the costs of the clean power plan um, were going to be so low um, that uh, really it was uh, not a, uh, a policy that the electric power industry in America really needed to worry too much about apart from uh, the regulatory burdens with it. Um, so I think that's um, something that Hopefully, um, the Republicans in, in Washington will look again at in terms of um, if they do want to ever um, address climate change in a, in a meaningful way in the next four years. They'll they'll look at how the clean power plan was was a, a cost effective way of doing that. Um, but you know, nothing more much to add. I mean, the states are moving ahead no matter what happens. I saw just uh, earlier today that Governor Brown in California, together with his counterparts in Oregon and Washington are going to double their efforts on, on climate change um, over the next four years because of the election. So, you know, it's, it's a reflection of um, two different parties with different uh, political priorities. Um, here in China, I can tell you there is no backsliding. Um, the Chinese government is 100% committed to decarbonization and um, implementing their 60 to 65% reduction in carbon intensity by, by 2030, and um, I'm quite uh, optimistic that they'll achieve that sooner than expected. Thank you, Jeff, and that actually uh, answered another question that we had already, so you're ahead of me there. Um, final question um, for all of you, but Jonathan Patzer, we start with you, is the UN Global Compact is recommending a shadow price of carbon at 100 US dollars. Um, could you give us a sense of whether that's a realistic shadow price to use for planning, capital investment planning? Thanks. Um, the UN Global Compact has really thought about a price um, that reflects 
John, something you'd said that, you know, in that first graph that you showed that much of, the, you know, while we get much more coverage of under carbon pricing initiatives, that price is too low to drive a major transformation uh, towards low carbon and displace some of the incumbent technologies. And so they put out a pretty high price. Most people would consider that really at the top of the range. So that would be something that would, a price that would force um, new kinds of investment, dramatically new kinds of investments in highly energy intensive uh, uh, companies and sectors, which of course are needed to really make progress. I think that its general applicability to all businesses should be questioned, uh, and every organization really needs to take a view as to what it's going to take for them to move their capital assets into a low carbon trajectory. And so I think that's a, a really great challenging perspective to put out there and a very bold one uh, and one that sort of thinks forward and says if we're going to decarbonize uh, all of the economy we're going to need to price something like that but as we work with organizations uh, like Microsoft with their carbon fee they see this future proofing of their business as a mechanism to set low costs of carbon using offsets other mechanisms and then gradually raise their ambition over time so that is a, a sort of a helpful complement to that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we are actually right on the hour. So I, I think it's just left for me to um, end the webinar to thank everyone again for attending and our speakers for their presentations. Uh, the webinar, webinar recording will be sent out to everyone shortly and please feel free to share it with your colleagues. And with that, we'd like to wish you all best wishes for the holiday season. Thank you.